Good morning. Good morning. Hope you're having a fine day so far. Today's Wednesday, so church night. Tonight is actually the uh, the academy is putting on their Christmas program. Ought to be awesome. So uh, if you can join us, that's awesome. But if you can't, we'll be live streaming it also. So, but let's start on our lesson for today and uh, open with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I'll praise you, Father. Praise you and thank you so much for these opportunities. These patterns we see all through your Bible to show us the correct way to worship you, uh, the correct way, the, uh, the way that you find honoring to you. And I got to admit that, uh, that it feels good to me also to be, to think about worshiping you the way that you want. I hope that I can uh, achieve the goals set before me, and I hope that you can uh, send us your Holy Spirit to help us in understanding your word in a powerful way. In Jesus' precious name I pray, amen. Okay, Exodus 32, and we'll take the next five verses. Decided uh, because uh, it's probably a good chance we've, got, we've gone through about 32 chapters of uh, Exodus. A little bit of a review, too, while we uh, start off this one. It still amazes me to this day that uh, that with all the things that they saw, that they were so quickly to go back into idolatry. Uh, but it just shows the power of God's forgiveness also. So we're going to be looking at God sees what's going on down in the camp. He tells Moses, and then uh, Moses is going to be returning down to the camp and see it for himself and get enraged over what they're doing after all God's done for him, for them. So we'll bring this picture in. This is the one that finally is for this chapter. Kind of showing Moses getting a little upset. He breaks one of the tablets in this picture. Uh, he's going. We're going to see that in this episode when he comes down and realizes what's going on. You might have to look really sharply, but in the background, you're going to see a golden calf way in the background there. I don't know if uh, you can see where my I'm circling. That's where the golden calf is. Of course, the people are all praising it. But uh, so let's get some verses in here. Not that one, but where are my verses? Over there. No, uh, you're not supposed to be over there. You're supposed to be over here. So we're going to start off, actually, in Romans. So while well, the next scene we find Moses enraged as to the conduct of the people, who have witnessed so much of the power of God, but somehow still believe slavery in Egypt was better and revert back to worshiping the creation rather than the creator. This is something that's, uh, I, I want to take this opportunity, that's why I brought up Romans here, to really talk about something I saw recently. They actually did the, what they call the Ten Commandments of uh, Climate Change recently uh, in, a, uh, in a video uh, talking about climate change. This is the this is the, what comes to mind when I think about worshiping the creation rather than the creator. And it's in Romans 1, 18 through 25. And this kind of sets the stage for how we don't look at God the, the way we should, but we uh, but they'll find all kinds of reasons to uh, to look at uh, other things in the world to worship other than God. And Paul speaks to this in Romans here. So let's start off with this verse to kind of set the stage. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because they which be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because this, because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto uncorruptible man, and to birds and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. 
Wherefore, God has given them up to uncleanliness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. This is, a, this is a, uh, symbolically of what we're talking about here, is that man seems to want to do it their way. They got all these grand ideas about what they think uh, is going to save the planet or, or what's damaging the planet. And the truth to be told is that uh, if they just look to God, God has got everything in control. Nothing to worry about. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't. We shouldn't be. Uh, I like clean water, and I love looking out on beautiful landscapes. So we shouldn't trash our, our planet. But I also don't think that we can do, as humans, we can do enough damage to the planet to be able to to uh, to cause the planet to be destroyed. I think only God can do that. And so that's my opening uh, monologue there about uh, this whole idea. Uh, just recently, they went up on Mount Sinai. That's what made me think of it. And they took the ten. They they wrote these new Ten Commandments about. Uh, uh, they call it an addendum to the Ten to Ten Commandments that God wrote. That's kind of uh, to me. That's blasphemy. Revelation tells us not to add to the Bible, and they're adding to the Bible. But they went up on Mount Sinai, the, not the one we we believe is the right one, but the other one down in uh, uh, Egypt. And they took tablets up with these rules written on them, and they smashed them like Moses, Moses did uh, in this story. That's what made me think of it. It's definitely, it's definitely not uh, biblical in any way. And, this, and that's why I wanted to point to this verse in Romans. But let's review a few things they all saw within about a year's time. So I'm just going to quickly go through the, uh, a few things they've seen and where they're located in the Bible, just as a kind of review. I won't read them. I read them all, particularly the plagues, because that's that's five chapters. I ain't got that much time. But so the so the list I I made up are just from uh, when uh, Moses first met them in Egypt until now. So we got the plagues uh, of Egypt, uh, plagues put on in Egypt. Uh, Israelites were unaffected. That's in Exodus chapters seven through twelve. So all those plagues were by God. And it, uh, and it was interesting as they affected the Egyptians, but didn't affect the uh, Israelites. The big one, the parting of the Red Sea. Pharaoh's army is destroyed. Uh, we see that in Exodus 14, 21 through 31. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them on the right hand and on the left. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And it came to pass that in the morning watch the Lord looked upon the host of Egyptians through the pillar of the fire and of the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians and took off their chariot wheels that they drove them heavily. So that the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel. For the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. And the Lord said unto Moses, stretch out thine hand over the sea, that the waters may come again unto the Egyptians, upon the chariots and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to the strength. When the morning appeared, and the Egyptians fled against it, and the Lord overflew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them. Killed them all. But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall unto them on the right hand and on the left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. Which shows bodies rolling up on the seashore. And Israel saw the great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians, and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Okay? So they believed them then. And so let's go to the next one. That's the longest one. But the next one is bitter waters. Remember the bitter waters. And uh, with the, uh, we just uh, a little bit of a, uh, a, uh, a trick with a branch that were able to make it sweet. That's in Exodus 15, 22 through 25. 
So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Merah, they could not drink of the waters of Merah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Merah. Merah. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. Then he made them for a statute and an ordinance, and, a, and, and, and there he proved them. The next one, uh, bread and quail dropped from heaven to feed them. Exodus 16, 4. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. Then jump into verse 13 through 18, add in the quail. And it came to pass that even the quails came up and covered the camp. In the morning, the dew laid around the host. <coughs> and when the dew that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing, as small as a hoar frost on the ground. That's the manna. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna, for they was, wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. Gather of it every man according to his eating, and Omar for every man according to the number of your persons. Take ye every man for them which are in his tents. And the children of Israel did so, and gathered some more and some less. And when they did meet it, it with an Omar, he had gathered much, had nothing over, and he had gathered little, had no lack. They gathered every man according to his eating. The quail was included now, was in that first verse. They don't talk about the quail as much here. They do in, they do in the other chapters. But uh, God was also gave them uh, meat to eat. Okay, the next miracle. Water out of a rock. That's a real trick. Out of the middle of the desert, all of a sudden a rock springs forth water. That was in uh, Exodus 17, 2 through 6. Wherefore, the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto these people? They are almost ready to stone me. Verse 5. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, and take with thee of the elders of Israel, and thy rod, wherewith thou smokest the river, take in thine hand, and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Okay, the next one, victory over Am Amalek's uh, army. That was one when Moses was standing up there with the rod above his head, and every time he loaded his rod, that uh, the Egyptians, uh, Joshua lost, when he raised his arm, so uh, they set it up where somebody helped uh, Moses hold up the rod. That was in Exodus 17, 9 through 13. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out, man, and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill, with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him, and fought with Amalek and Moses. Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass, and Moses held up his hand, and Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat thereon, and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady, until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Basically, he, they, they were successful in killing them off. And the last one up to this point, God speaking to them from Mount Sinai. Now, he even heard the verse voice of the Lord. And that was Exodus 19, 2 through 6 and 16 through 21. So let's read through that as a re, uh, refresher. This is the last of the refreshers. But they were departed from uh, Rephelim and were come to the desert of Sinai and had pitched in the wilderness, and there Israel camped before the mount. And Moses went up unto God, and God 
the Lord God called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel. You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a particular, a peculiar treasure unto me all, above all the people, for all the earth is mine. Verse 6. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Okay, and jumping down to verse 16, we're going to see what God speaks to them directly. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thundering and lightning and a thick cloud upon the mount. And the voice of the trumpet exceedingly loud, so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the, at the nether part of the mount. And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace. And the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. And the Lord came down unto Mount Sinai on the top of the mount, and the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount, and Moses went up. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go down, charge the people, lest they break through into the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. So that's when God spoke directly to the to the. To the uh, Israelites. So you see, and so the basic what I'm getting at here is they've seen all this stuff happen. They got to know God exists. They got to be. So why would why would they believe that Moses isn't coming back? Because uh, they've seen all these miracles. Moses was following the rules as we just read uh, by going up to see the God. I don't think God's intent was to kill him. So why would these people even think that way? And there will be more in the future as we look at them. But I thought it'd be a good time for a review. No, uh, we will see in numbers if we get that far before the rapture. I've mentioned a few already, but point being, how can I even imagine going back? Let's see this play out and actually a beautiful story of God's forgiveness. But as any good father would be, his judgment also. In this case, he's going to purge out the, uh, the leaven, the sin. <clears throat> we won't get to that today, but uh, that's going to be the ultimate goal. Okay, so back to uh, Exodus 32, starting in verse 15. And Moses turned and went down from the mount, and the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. And the tables were written on both their sides. On the one side and on the other were they written. So they're written on both sides. You notice they call it the uh, testimony were in his hand. They don't call it the Ten Commandments. They don't say that's all that's on there. I have a feeling that uh, you know, over these last 40 days, we've already been studying a lot of the things that, that God had instructed Noah to do. So I believe that he has uh, he's actually got a lot more information on those tablets than just the Ten Commandments. Traditionally, that's what most people believe. But Okay, verse 16. And the tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God, graven upon the tables. So talking about the testimony in Exodus 16.34, as the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron laid it up before the testimony to be kept. Exodus 40.20, and he took and put the testimony into the ark and set the staves on the ark and put the mercy seat above uh, above upon the ark. So that's where the this, these two stones are going to end up, but they haven't even built it yet. That's going to be coming up here shortly. Deuteronomy 5.22. These words the Lord spake unto all your assembly in the mount, and of the midst of the fire and of the cloud, and the thick darkness were a great voice, and he added no more. And he wrote them in two tables of stone and delivered them unto me. Psalms 19.7 <clears throat> the, <law, clears throat> the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soil. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Always follow God's word and you won't go wrong. It's a whole counsel of God, though. Not just uh, piecemeal uh, verse here and there. And then seven, 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture. This is what I'm uh, leading up to. All scripture. Not part of it. 
Not, but all of it, every single word, is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. It's a great verse. And notice it's 3.16. And we got John 3.16 as a great verse. Here, Timothy, I mean, Paul, through, through Timothy, gives us a great verse also. Written on both sides. This is an indication of a covenant. We see this in Deuteronomy 9.15. So I turned and came down from the mount, and the mount burned with fire, and the two tables of the covenant were in my hand, two hands. So it was a covenant. As we see, one of the uh, title deeds uh, that will be, that's still future yet, that we're going to witness when, when we get to heaven. That's in Revelation 5.1. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. That Jesus is going to take and open to get the, uh, to take back the earth. We can see here, so it's similar in nature, is that it's written on both sides. And at least for the scrolls, typically they didn't write on both sides. So one side was rougher than the other. But in the case of the scroll, whatever was written on the back side was instructions on how who was able to open it. That's usually what it was. But in this case, on the, the tablets, is this, I believe there's a lot more there than just the Ten Commandments. That's what I'm saying. There's a slight indication of this in Deuteronomy 9, 9 through 11. When I was gone up to, into the mount to receive the, the tables of stone, even the tables of the covenant, See there, it mentions it again, with the Lord made with you that I abode in the mount for 40 days and 40 nights. I neither did eat bread nor drink water. That's a long time, but I don't need food or water. But only God could, could, could do that when it comes to the water part, especially. And the Lord delivered unto me two tables of stone written with the finger of God, and on them was written according to all these words, which the Lord spake with you in the mount of the, out of the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And it came to pass at the end of 40 days and 40 nights, the Lord gave me the two tables of stone, even the tables of, this, of the covenant. And jumping down to verse 15. So I turned and came down from the mount, and the, and the mount burned with fire, and two tables of the covenant were in my two hands. So this all confirms that there was two tablets. They came down off the mount, and that they were written on both sides. And that they were mostly... Uh, it was a covenant between God and man. Okay, verse 17 and 18. When Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp. And he said, It is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome. But the noise of them that sing do I hear. So they were at a place on this mountain that, that was not, you couldn't see the valley. And I think that that is another clue. Of this mountain and why, and uh, let me get that one picture I like that shows it. The angle I want to show you. Yeah, that's a good one. get my bigger cursor okay so I, the people are in this general area down here and you can see the black area up here this is where Moses is so to get to, to, to get up there you would actually follow this uh, this, uh, this there's a little bit of a uh, I forget what that's called a spur uh, but uh, this little valley area going up the side of the mountain. And I've climbed enough mountains to know you can't go straight up a mountain typically. Uh, so you probably follow this up a, this air angle and then turn and then go up to the top. And most likely they're in somewhere around this area here, up here. And I got one more picture that shows that. So this is the actual top. And they would have come in from this side over here. So most likely they're... And the other thing is, is that Joshua wasn't with, was was about halfway up. Moses went all the way to the top, but Joshua didn't go all the way to up. 
So I'm not sure where exactly in here, but you can see that it's not easy to see down is what, it is, what I'm driving at. I used to have, oh, this is the picture I was looking for. So they would have, Moses would have gone up, gone up like this way and then come up, come up uh, along this side here. It would have been up here somewhere. But he most likely could not have seen down here because there's other mountains in the way. So most likely when they came around and got to this area here where they could see down through this uh, uh, valley here is when they saw what was going on. So that kind of takes us back to the picture we uh, had. Of the painted picture that was get, uh, that I've been using. So this looks a little bit like when they came around the side, this might be the uh, starting of that thing that goes down towards the valley. It's probably where they saw him. It's probably where Aaron was. But Aaron didn't hear him either, according to, according to Scripture. So, continuing here. But the noise of, the, uh, but the noise of them sing do I hear. Verse 19. And it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh unto the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger waxed hot. And he cast the tables out of his hands and brake them beneath the mount. So we see here that the camp was not visible from where Moses and Joshua were. And we side note, it's interesting that Joshua, is, uh, who succeeds Moses, is also up on the mountain, leaving Aaron to deal with the people. But I'm willing to bet if Joshua, based on the conduct during the occupation, of the promised land, he would not have, this not, would, this not would have happened. I don't think Joshua would have allowed it. If we ever get to Joshua, which is even way later, uh, you can really see that Joshua is a strong military leader type. Uh, my uh, treasury of uh, scripture knowledge is called TSK. It's part of the E-Sword, and, uh, and they make comments, and it's usually a gathering of different comments from different uh, theologians on a subject. And here it writes, Joshua had waited patiently during all the 40 days in the place where Moses had left him, below the summit of the mount, at a distance from the people, and out of the way of temptation. Which to me speaks volumes to how to avoid being tempted into sin. Just like a person who's an alcoholic doesn't go hang out in bars, uh, is a good example. Uh, that's my one of my problem ne nemesis is it uh, so I I have no desire to go anymore to show that since I found the Lord I really have no desire to be in a place that, that only that, that main purpose in life is to serve alcohol but that, that's why I use that as an example but there's plenty of others I remember uh, Pastor Storm used to do this thing uh, up on stage uh, if you know the stage on the uh, uh, in our church. Uh, the pulpit's in the center, and he would walk all the way over to the side uh, near the piano, and he would draw a line. And he says, "Okay, this, his his where sin is," as in, and then he would draw a line, and then he'd walk all the way over to the other side of the of the uh, stage, and he said, "This is where you should be. You shouldn't be anywhere near that line. Uh, you shouldn't be straddling it. You shouldn't be close to it." And so the symbology there is, so that if you fall into sin. When you're way over to, on the other side, you won't. Uh, when you stumble and you make mistakes, you won't fall into sin. But if you're straddling the line over there, when you when you when you do fall and fail, you will fall back into sin. Uh, that was I thought it was a great symbology. Uh, so. So Deuteronomy 9.17 also speaks to this. And I took the two tables and cast them out of my two hands and break them before your eyes. So basically, they broke every commandment they could think of. Uh, and that's why I want to go through that list. After seeing all the things they see, I saw and the, the promises they made to God that they were going to they, that they believed that he existed. They, they knew he existed and they were going to obey him. Here it is, and they're already breaking, uh, breaking just about every commandment they can think of. Okay, verse 20. And he took the calf, which they had made, and burnt it in the fire, and ground it to powder, and, and straw it, in, and straw, and straw it, it upon the water. Basically, probably kind of threw it into the water, into the water, the, the, and made the children of Israel drink it. And I thought this was very symbolic. A way of saying that uh, uh, 
you love this sin so much, you're actually going to drink it. And there's actually another a similar situation that happened uh, in Numbers. Numbers 5.17, which is kind of similar to what, uh, what Moses did here. Uh, 517 is actually a, uh, this, this is a story of uh, when, a, when a husband and wife, uh, when, when the husband thought the wife had cheated on him, uh, had committed adultery or some other sexual sin, there was a process that uh, the, father, the husband could go to the priest and the priest would make up this bitter water, they called it, uh, and force the woman to drink it. And if it didn't taste bitter to her, that meant that she was innocent. But if it did taste bitter, then it meant she was guilty. Uh, kind of an archaic way of trying to trying to do it like a, a truth serum. But I think it was more the fear of what was going to happen if it was if it tasted bitter, then she would be accused of being uh, an adulteress and then be stoned to death. And so uh, it was probably more the fear of it than anything. And if if she had done something wrong, she probably would have admitted it at that point to try to get. To, to plead for mercy. So that's kind of the setup here. And the priest shall take holy water in an earthen vessel, and of the dust that is in the floor of the tabernacle, the priest shall take and put it into the water. Jump into verse 24. He shall cause the woman to drink the bitter water that causes the curse, and the water that causes the curse shall enter into her and become bitter. So a type of punishment we see in Numbers, uh, continuing with this idea, and also in verses 12 through 15, talks about the, uh, the actual punishment. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, If any man's wife go aside and commit a trespass against him, and a man lie with her carnally, and it, and it be hid from his eyes of her husband, and, and, and be kept close, and she be defiled, and there be no witness against her, neither shall be taken with the, taken with the manner. So she did, the husband suspects she did something wrong, doesn't have any proof, uh, and there's no witnesses. That's basically what that verse said. Tongue twister for me. And the spirit of jealousy came upon him, and he be jealous of his wife, and she be defiled. Or if the spirit of jealousy came upon him, and he be jealous of his wife, and she be not defiled. Then shall the man bring his wife unto the priest, and he shall bring her offering for her the tenth part of an ephah of barley meal. He shall pour no oil upon it, nor put frankincense thereon, but as an offering of jealousy, an offering of memorial, uh, bringing iniquity to remembrance. So supposedly it was supposed to uh, entice the woman to uh, come clean. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know how successful that would be, but I'm just uh, I can see the, par the, the pattern here. Uh, that Moses is doing with his gold dust uh, into the water and is paralleled later on in Numbers because uh, Moses wrote Numbers too. So uh, sounds like a similar penalty he's going to use then too. <clears throat> so anyways, we're going to stop there for today. Hope you enjoyed the little review and the fact that Moses is down and he's going to be dealing with these people. And there is going to be some God's judgment, uh, but uh, it's going to be great to see Moses actually go to bat for the people. And I think all along, I've been talking about this test yesterday, and I think all along this whole thing has been a test of Moses and his uh, management style. Uh, was he going to uh, stand for the people or was he going to allow God to destroy them all? <clears throat> <clears throat> so we'll talk more about that tomorrow. And hope to see you at church tonight. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you, Lord, so much for this uh, opportunity to uh, review your word and to get an idea of, uh, of the things that uh, we can prove that you do definitely exist. And all, all these things definitely happen. And it actually, we found some evidence, uh, archaeological evidence, that uh, helps us to see these are true. But, Lord, I know you're, uh, you're there and you help us uh, continuously. I feel your spirit within me all the time. And I give you praise and thanks for all you do. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> now I need to go clear my throat. <laughs> Sorry if I'm, uh, I still have problems with swallow, saliva gets caught in my throat. So that's why I get froggy like this. 
So I will talk to you guys again tomorrow. Have a great day.